Hello, my finest of friends, and welcome to another Rahala Stapa. Uh, it's another remote one, and uh, we always intend to do a couple of remote ones, but uh, this week and the week of this recording, if you're watching the video, you'll see I'm still in my pyjamas. Uh, I have been struggling with the coronavirus. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. Uh, I have COVID-19. I don't know if any of you have had that particular COVID version. Um, I got the 19th one. Um, didn't affect me too badly. I still have it right as I'm speaking, uh, but uh, I'm feeling fine. Uh, but I did this recording with Laura um, at midday on uh, Monday, the, uh, if you want to, fact fans, if you're into fact, Monday the 10th of January it was. I was unsure of the date when we did it as well. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, oh, look, see that little cough. Uh, don't worry, you can't catch this down the line. Um, and uh, it was lovely to chat to Laura. She did one of the Edinburgh shows, uh, but this was a full interview with her about her fantastic book, Clop Actually, which I highly recommend, certainly as, especially as an audio book um, and uh, many more stuff beside. We are doing live gigs. Uh, the um, We did have to cancel the uh, one lot, which we did online. Uh, but we will be back at the Phoenix on the 24th of February with Mark Watson and Ahir Shah. And uh, we're at the Bristol Slapstick Festival at the end of the month and Leicester Comedy Festival on the 19th of February, which is selling well with Jos Norris and Rebecca Wheatley. And then back to Rahala Stapa at the Leicester Square Theatre at the end of February. So please do come and see us live if you can or watch us live streamed on those Leicester Square Theatre gigs. Uh, go to richtang.com slash gigs for all information about those. But for now, let's sit back, relax and enjoy Rahalastapa with the wonderful, the very funny, Laura Lex. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a man who carried on podcasting when he just had a testicle removed. So COVID can't stop him. It's Richard Herring. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another remote uh, Richard Herring's long slowly terminating podcast <laughs> uh i have covid i've got covid as at last it's it feels like quite an achievement uh though i was hanging around with the ebola virus uh the other day it's a bit pissed off that it's been overshadowed in the news lately by this newcomer it's planning a comeback everyone so watch out for it anyway it calls it rahala so uh, yes i um on saturday i tested this is monday we're recording this on monday the something of January, about 11th of January, I think it is. I don't know anymore. I've been in bed for two days. Um, and uh, on Saturday, I didn't even really feel that bad. I just uh, I hadn't really slept overnight. And so I thought that And the thing, all the all the uh, symptoms I had were just the same symptoms I've had for the last seven years since I became a parent in that I felt a little bit tired. Uh, I had a slight sore throat. And then I had to go to sleep in the afternoon. And when I woke up, I just thought, oh, maybe I should just take a test just to be sure. Uh, and after all the tests I've taken, suddenly to have those uh, two lines appear uh, on the on the thing, it, it happened instantaneously as well. It was absolutely 100% uh, clear. I've had a PCR test as well. It's definitely, it's definitely there. Um, and uh, it's quite exciting to get it. Uh, also, I'm not very ill yet. Uh, so it's nice to be carrying on. Uh, I, I think I probably caught it. I went to see Panto Land at the Palladium uh, last Wednesday, which we postponed from before Christmas because we didn't want to get COVID. And then I thought, well, we I, I don't mind if I get COVID now because we can, can see it. It's, it's inevitably going to happen. Uh, it was nice to see Donny Osmond doing pastiches of his old songs, but I'm not sure it was worth dying for. That would be my review <laughs> of, <laughs> of Panto Land. It wasn't really a panto. It was just bits of a panto. It was all right. It wasn't that good. Uh, anyway, this is the first uh, the first Rahalastapa that I have ever done in my pajamas. I'm wearing my Christmas pajamas if you're watching. Um, and um, it also could be the last. If if things take a turn for the worse, it could be my last ever Rahalastapa. So that's that's very exciting. I want it to go out, even if I if I die or if I go into one of those comas that people get. I want this to go out in, and just have a sad picture of me. You know. Maybe Chris Evans could hold a picture of me, not that one, and uh, uh, and look sad, and, and then we could still put it out. So it's, <laughs> it's a big, big responsibility for our guest this week. Uh, uh, but so uh, yeah, it's 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 nice to have it because I've got to isolate. We've got an attic where I can isolate where all my stuff is, my snooker board, my all my streaming equipment, and my puppets. So I can still and I can work. And I'm not allowed to go downstairs. My wife has to bring me all my meals. None of the rest of them have got it. It's the absolute. I've got a week of having a holiday. I, don't, I can sleep in. 
it, apart from having testicular cancer, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Both of these <laughs> things gave me a wonderful break from my family. Uh, and I'm drinking Lemsip. And, you know, how bad a disease can it be that the treatment is Lemsip? That's what I'm saying. I'm not going to turn into one of these COVID conspiracy theorists, but, you know, I wasn't expecting to be drinking Lemsip this week. Uh, and it and it works. It's, it is the cure. It's a shame no one knew. Anyway, look, let's crack on just in case I fade a bit. I am a little bit tired. So, mm, delicious. Mm, Lemsip. Buy some Lemsip. It's the cure for COVID-19. Um, oh, damn, they're not sponsorous. I'm trying to get them sponsorous. Anyway, my guest this week, but possibly the finest fi- final ever rehearsed for guest. That's true of every guest, I suppose, once we, when they're just being on. Um, she is best known for her appearance on the Edinburgh Rahalastapa in 2019. That's why we've all come to see her. She was very good on that. I listened. To, I don't usually listen back, but I listened back to that one, and uh, she was very good. So pressure's on for this one. Uh, will you please welcome the amazing, the amazing? I've got to remember to put her on. Laura Lex, there she is. Hello, Laura. Yay! Lovely to see you. Hello. Thanks for having me. If you do die of COVID, yes. can I take over the podcast, please? Like, yeah, we'll, we'll do yeah. it like that interviewing show you know where you just keep taking it and then when i die whoever my last guest was yeah. they can have it well okay that's a good idea i think Wicked. that's a good, I'm, I'm mainly mainly people i interview are younger than me as well so that you should work out <laughs> but you know it could be bad if uh it'd been the nicholas parsons week it would have been a change um yeah i'm happy to i'm happy to do that uh lala, it'll be a lala has lala that'd be a bit hard because it's three oh, l's yeah. la 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 stupper it's like a Welsh that yeah. you have to do all in Welsh. <laughs> um, very good. Have you had COVID yet? Have you, have no, you, no, no. I'm dodging it. Like, a, wow. yeah, I'm. I'm surprised I haven't. But yeah, no. I think I'm immortal, though. I'm. I'm very immune to everything. Just naturally, it just bounces so. off my big shiny forehead. <laughs> well, I thought that. I was really starting to think I'm not going to get it at all. Um, but uh, it's int- you know again it's I think all these things are sort of interesting as 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 long as you survive them as a comedian anything bad that happens to you as long as you survive you think well this there's something in yeah. this I mean not I'm a bit late to the party with this one I think but if you want time the- to get it triple yeah. vaxxed get in yeah. now where you can say you had it but you had it once <laughs> the scientists had taken the edge off it you know yeah. Yeah, I didn't even yeah. get side effects off my jabs. Like, I just feel like, were they real? Like, everybody else I know is like, oh, I had flu for a day after the jab. And I was like, mm-hmm, I didn't. I just bounced about. Like, Have you have you had your booster? Yeah. Because the, the yeah. booster was the only I had. And my arm felt a little bit sore after the booster. That's the, and I was, uh, but I've been ill all, like, because I've got kids and because they haven't really been at school. And this is the first, you know, they've gone back to school this winter. I've just been had all the bugs again for the last two or three months. I've been ill for two or three months, and this is the least bad thing that, that I've good. had that this is winter. That is so far. for science, isn't it? Well done, vaccines. <laughs> so yeah, so the but so it's hard to know if the booster did anything or whether I was just ill with something else. But you know, not to say that we, you know, we're not. I'm generally not saying that. Uh, other people have not had different experiences. Clearly, they have had this terrible, awful thing. But as comedians, it's our job, you know. If I if I laugh my way through testicular cancer, I have to laugh my way through <laughs> this as well. I think it's fair to say. Yeah. Hey, look. Um. I look. Do, do, hey, do you remember being on my podcast? In yeah. 2019? Was it? Was, was it Tony Law? Was he the it other was. guest? Well done, yeah. Well, well remember. Yeah. I don't remember anything at all about any of those. I have to say, like a lot. Now my memory's got so bad that I don't really. You know, we do. I do so many of these. Mostly they disappear. I wouldn't remember who the other guest was. I listened back to it because I didn't remember what we talked about, so I just wanted to check what we talked about. No, I remember um, sitting on but, a nice big throne. Yeah, that's right. We were in a Masonic lodge and we did discuss that. And uh, there was something. Oh, the, the one thing you said that I want to talk about in that was we were talking about um, the the big Edinburgh scandal that year was how much the prices of the flats and the lodgings yeah, had gone up. Yeah. And you said maybe in 2020 none of us should come up. <laughs> and I'm <Did> wondering. I? <laughs> yeah. And I'm wondering. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if all of this was started by Laura Lex. Did I curse it? It, it sounds Laura Lex sounds like the name of a of a sort of super mm, villain, That's, doesn't it? My so. socialist ways. <laughs> oh, wouldn't that be the absolute middle class bougiest thing to do to start a global pandemic just to fix the lives <laughs> of starving artists going to a festival that they don't have to go to? Yeah, <laughs> that is a Pixar it, film waiting to happen. <laughs> it just got out of control. Um, but look, the big thing, I mean, this. The, well, let's talk about this straight away, because the big thing that's happened to you, uh, it certainly, 
Uh, well, just before lockdown, it sort of started to happen, right? In that you, you I mean, this is, I, I love this story. Uh, and uh, it's all in your book, which is called Klopp, actually. If I get the audio book, because it's very good fun to hear you reading, the, reading all of this out. But also the story of how this all began, this book of Klopp, actually, is just sort of, is like a little movie in the, the, <laughs> the, the bit. We were all about to, you were concerned about you know live comedy, which is your absolute meat and potatoes, right? You're yeah. you're a you're a, a working comedian. You do most of your work in clubs, um, and just coping with the fact that you were you realised everything was about to shut down. Yeah, and, and you sent out a tweet, and from there, yeah, this, uh, this this whole beautiful thing emerged. So tell us a little bit about that kind of origin of this. It idea. was mad. It was it was the weekend before. Um, England shut down and I was in Glasgow doing the Glee um, and it was just that weird weekend of being like I kind of need to do these gigs in case we do lose all our work but I felt <laughs> so guilty about like being the reason people had come out to a crowded thing not that I was the reason I was just on a mixed bill but you know yeah, yeah. and I didn't have a mask yet and you couldn't get hold of sanitizer so I just sat in the hotel room a weekend and then when I got back to the hotel after the gigs I tweeted the stupidest joke about if I ever met Jurgen Klopp I'd um, I'd say if we had a baby, we should call it Clip, just so he'd raise an eyebrow at me um, <laughs> and tell me I'm a moron and, and you know, I'd get naked. And um, and then it was sort of quite late at night and I and I quite like doing threads. So I started doing this stupid little thread of like, he'd be very serious and I'd find that sexy. Um, and then I sort of went to bed and then the next morning I was like, well, I still don't have a mask or any hand sanitizer, so I'm not going to go and traipse around Glasgow, like trying to catch this disease that's apparently <laughs> going to kill us all. So I stayed in my hotel room and carried on tweeting. And I think I might have been the only positive thing happening on Twitter. <laughs> that day. Like, because everything was either, oh, isn't Jurgen Klopp really nice? or we're all going to die probably on Tuesday. Yeah. So this being the only happy thing, it just went bananas. Um, and I kind of thought, like, you know, I've gone viral before, but this was mad. This, I think I picked up something like 32,000 followers. I went from 8,000 followers to 40,000 <laughs> in a day. Um, but I just thought, like, oh, you know, stuff goes viral, and then the next day it goes back to normal. Um, but then there were people, like publishers, getting in touch and going, do you want to write this as a book? And I was sort of thinking, like, no, it's a very thin joke. <laughs> I think <laughs> stretching this to a book is a very bad idea. And then I lost all my income, and I went, do you know what, I could write a book. I, that that it sounds like a really good book, actually. Yeah, let's do that. So, um, yeah, we found a really nice publisher publisher who would let me do it my way because I was like look it it's it's the, I've worn the joke as thin as it will go as it is on the Twitter thread like that that's the end of it no one I would be conning people out of their money but I said like I don't want it to be like a I don't want to objectify the poor guy I don't want it to be like anything I, I'm not comfortable with but if it was an exploration of like actually feeling a bit insecure and sort of having this guardian angel of like sexy football manager keep coming in and and sort of saying all the things that you know but you know, don't remember at the time could we do it that way and and the lovely publishers were like yeah let's go for it and so that's what I spent my first lockdown doing was sort of <laughs> sitting in my spare room and, and I, I, like, I know nothing about football I cannot <laughs> explain how little I know so I was like coming up with these smutty puns and then like running them past my husband going <laughs> is this accurate would you say in the penalty area or what? like <laughs> oh man it was so surreal I don't it's it's so it's, it's I think when especially when you hear it all told in the in the audiobook which I massively recommend and it does you know it you would I agree you think oh this can't stretch your book but it, there's loads of reasons it does and it really does but I think the those initial tweets you do, the run of tweets that you've that you read through, you know, you do you you say it, you've absolutely hit the ground running with it. You're like, it's funny. It starts with a, a joke, but then the whole thing is so beautifully explored and just so imaginatively explored. Obviously, because you were seeing like, yeah, nothing bored. else to do. <laughs> but but like it's it really it really hits the ground running. So it's so good. But I think it's because it's about. It's about sort of fantasy as well. Isn't it? Yeah. You know, I, I, was, I was thinking it's like a two-hour answer to Freud's question, what do women want? It's sort of, there's, there's yeah. the answer, Dr. Freud. That's <laughs> what thought, one of them wants. <laughs> I sort of thought, like, I just... I've, 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 oh, I'm such a, like, wimp when it comes to the idea of 
doing things that are edgy. And so I wanted to, like, we did talk about doing it as an illustrated book and having Klopp be this little guardian angel, like a tiny version, <laughs> like sitting on the top of the wardrobe chatting and, and things like that. But I just, I wanted a way, you know, like when you want to talk about something serious, but you're like, I would roll my eyes at any sort of self-help book. So how yeah. can I write an almost self-help book that you don't really realize is a self-help book? Because that sort of stuff Definitely. makes my stomach churn. But but it's it's, it's also funny. it's a self-help. I think I'm sure it is a self-help for women. But I think any any men out there, the kind of men who go, why don't women like nice guys? Yeah. Uh, what, uh, what do women want? Any men who are asking those questions, like Dr. Freud, like Simon Mundy does the fantastic joke of what do women want if only we could ask them yeah <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> that, that someone would write a whole book about this as a psychologist and not get, get to that point but any men you just get a real window into the things that yeah. would make somebody no, just another human being happy it's not even really about men and women I have to say though I do a lot of the things that Jurgen Klopp does in my marriage and my well wife n- but my wife never has sex with me on the kitchen floor over the as a result so well, I do the di- no. <laughs> I do the dishwasher, the bins. I'm I'm, I'm a I'm a great husband. Maybe you need thicker rimmed glasses. Maybe, maybe that's what it is. Maybe it is. It's so funny. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure it'll work. Is what I'm saying. I'm not sh- yeah. saying to fellas, if you do all these things, your wife or partner will <laughs> will immediately creep. I mean, there's a lot of knicker creaming basically there is. throughout throughout this book, which is very enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> in a comedic sense, and I'm sure in a, a natural sense, but um, I'm not sure that that. But it, but it, it, you know, it's so it's it's just this glimpse of a simple life, and where you can go to Waitrose and you yeah. can shop at Waitrose and always have your remember to take your bags with you and stuff like. It's it's not just about relationships; it's about the the kind of idle wish fulfillment of how you imagine your own life. Yeah could be better, even though obviously it wouldn't really be. I mean, it would be a bit not better, but it wouldn't be way better. It's, I it's, think like. Because I'm such an anxious person, but yeah. I think I'm not. I'm not a stupid person, and I'm very practical. But when I'm completely het up, I don't remember any of the useful ways. Like one thing goes wrong, and suddenly I'm sitting on the kitchen floor going, "Well, what is the point of even trying to be a comedian? I'm never going to do this, this, and this, and this." But when I and and I wish at that point. I had access to all of the very reasonable <laughs> beliefs yeah. I have about myself, but they've gone, they've shut down. And and so like that, that was what I kind of wanted to explore at was just like, like if you had access to the best part of you when you needed you, what would that look like if it was Jürgen yeah. Klopp, who was much so better than So that's why, me. you know, I think it really, it, it's, a, it's a, I mean, it's a short, it's not a long book. No. It's a two hour, a two hour long, a two hour long audio book, the shortish book, uh, which is, I think, perfect. You know, especially, <laughs> especially for lockdown. I don't, you know, I'm finding it so hard to read, except this week where I've got nothing to do. I've been reading books again. It's great. But it's like, it is really, like when I used to go on holiday with my wife before I had kids, I would just read for the whole holidays. Yeah. And this is what this, this is what this week is, is turning into for me. But uh, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really good length. And the, the audio is lots of fun. I like the bit where you discuss whether, how you were going to do uh, Jürgen Klopp's voice <laughs> in the audio book. So it's very charming that you make, you make the decision not to try yeah. and do an imitation of him. Can't Although, do it. Through lockdown, <laughs> I was doing this project through the first bit of, of like full lockdown. You know, when we were all sl- going slightly mad trying to work out how to put content that was original on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> I was doing this thing called the book club where I was writing a chapter of a book and then at the end there'd be a vote on what would to happen next. And right. viewers had like 12 hours to vote and then I'd write the next chapter the next day and, and we'd read it live together on YouTube the next night. And in that, the viewers very quickly worked out that I couldn't do accents to save my life. <laughs> and so we had all these like Swedish characters, these Italians coming in and it, and it was supposed to be like a bit of a writing exercise for me and it just turned into this game of them trying to back me into various <laughs> European accents and me trying to squeeze my way back out of them. Ugh, bad. But it's, well, you really embraced, you know, I, I was sort of doing a lot of stuff online. I found lockdown, you know, very creatively uh, inspiring in lots of ways because you were forced to shoehorn. I mean, a lot, a couple of the things I was doing in my normal life anyway, online turned out to be sort of very lockdown like podcasts anyway, but it, it, but you kind of embrace again, because, you know, you are, you know, because you, you are, you ha- you were making your main living as a club comedian, as, as so many comedians were, um, and hopefully will again, <laughs> or are again, <laughs> will, will again soon. Um, but to suddenly have everything sort of snatched away, you either kind of have to go into a pit of despair or, 
or think of something you can do. And you really seem to embrace uh, oh, online stuff. Or do you think you were doing it already? Uh, no, I think I did jump into it. But I think it, it's that panic of like, there's no other money anywhere in my life other than if I earn it. Like I don't, I don't yeah. have parents with money. I don't that like we were halfway through buying a house when the whole lockdown thing hit and we so nearly pulled out of buying our first house. And then I got the book deal and I was like, all right, yeah, that'll cover. And like, because of the whole rent market being ridiculous, it was cheaper for us to buy the house and move in month to month. The mortgage is cheaper than the rent was. So we were like, I guess we go with it and hope this thing's over in two years. Like that, <laughs> yeah. that's because I'm married to a comedian as well. So we would both lost like all income coming in. And I think like people that are from that background of like got into whatever they wanted to do via having six part-time jobs to support it all you went back into grifter mode <laughs> like yeah. genuinely like wrote my first book going well that'll pay the mortgage <laughs> and like the book deal that they offered me was write the clock book and then do you want to write any other novel and I was like that well that's another year of yeah. work so that's good I just started a podcast about days out, which was very, very <laughs> difficult to do. Um, so do you got because I listened to some of those. I listened to the Richard the Third one, where you go to the you with um, yeah, Will Duggan. Will. You go, went to the uh, visit the Richard the Third visitor center in the one I listened to. It's really good. Had you already recorded? We'd quite recorded a few of them. seven, right. and then everything hit. So we did record a couple of like we got my husband Tom to do um, like a Dungeons and Dragons style day trip to a zoo where right. we remotely did that so tom was like talking us through this day trip we haven't put those out because of various issues that i'm not legally allowed to talk about okay. but um <laughs> no we just had to pause but we sort of pivoted that so we we started doing interviews on youtube we found people that worked at or had a passion for places and we interviewed them about their places so they'd right. come and tell us and then we also started doing this weekly podcast called Years and Years where each week we pick like a one year in history and we do a deep dive in researching that and tell the other one about it. So just everything I was trying to do, we just sort of had to slightly go, all right, how do we do that from in the house instead? <laughs> But it's you know it's it feels like you just had a, a incredibly fecund last couple. Of, I mean you were always you know it's a very impressive amount of stuff you've done before, and you've done you know as well as being a club comedian, you've done these sort of award winning Edinburgh shows and you'd, you'd and 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 big sort of five star Edinburgh shows as well, which we talked about last yeah. time. Um, so you know it's it's you because I feel like a few you know it, both in terms of Edinburgh and and. Uh, lockdown some some club comedians are very much like i'm a club comedian and that's it and i don't i'm not interested in doing edinburgh and losing lots of money and i'm not you know and, and they and they and the lockdown came and they, they had no way of kind of even making the leap across i think you mm. know they, it was too it was to just suddenly have to diversify like that was was difficult thing and obviously everyone was doing it so you've you've got this you already had this openness or the open-mindedness uh, of, yeah. uh, and, and, and interest in exploring lots of different things. I think one of the things lockdown did, and I don't quite know how to verbalise this, so I'm really sorry if this comes out like judgy or, or not right, but like I think the circuit's amazing and the circuit produces really hard and really brilliant comedians. And you... I certainly spent like seven or eight years of my life trying to get really good on the circuit. And then you hit a point where you realize that nobody outside of the circuit knows how good people on the circuit are. So yeah. then you start to realize that the people that are moving quicker up the comedy career path are not the ones who are smashing it on the circuit necessarily. They're the ones doing other things, but those things are getting noticed quicker. So in a way, lockdown solved a problem I had where I was so entrenched in needing the circuit to earn a living and I was doing well there, but I didn't have time to do all of the off-circuit things that go on the internet or go into the London pool of getting noticed by producers or making shorts or... Yeah. finishing those script ideas that I've been sitting on I, there, there isn't time and energy enough to do the circuit well and do those well and the circuit if you need the circuit to make money can almost 
distract you from doing the things that push yeah. your career up the TV or radio or script path a little bit, which is yeah. so counterintuitive. It's- it is, and I understand. You know, I understand both points of view, and I, you know, and there's obviously it, being a stand-up comedian and just working as a stand-up comedian is an end in itself, and people should be happy with that if that was yeah, if that's yeah. what they want to do. But you're absolutely right. If you want to to push things forward, if you, you know, it's not necessarily it's not not it's the, you can still get on TV if you're if you concentrate on stand-up. But you're absolutely right that I think you need to, this. The competition is so intense, mm. and I guess you know because it's a bit skewed things are a bit skewed towards edinburgh and, I, and that's why i understand the people who resent it because it's it's now become so big it's almost in, it, impossible to get discovered in edinburgh anyway but the producers are looking at edinburgh and they're not they're not going see, to comedy even, clubs are they even going to edinburgh anymore yeah, maybe or are they just not, maybe waiting not. to see what's at the soho afterwards yeah i don't probably. want to sound like a bitter twat which i have a real <laughs> tendency to fall down a bit of a bitter twat rabbit warren but are they going to Edinburgh in the same way, or is it looking for people that go viral now? Like I, do, I don't even think it's Edinburgh anymore. I think it's no. the internet. I think it's TikTok, Instagram, t- to a lesser extent Twitter, but it's who can make shorts for yeah. that because that's your script writing, that's your acting, that's you are an are you an engaging face, and that's a much quicker measure. Yeah. Why, as a producer, would you go up to Edinburgh and watch loads of? shit hours of comedy <laughs> where you can just see what's got 900 retweets and see if the you know yeah I think that's true and I think you know I'm, I'm happier with that I mean I think again I think I said this in the last the last time you're on but you know you're going to Edinburgh spending maybe 10,000 pounds and if, if you've got 10,000 pounds to spare you can you can create something online that's amazing <laughs> and then that's the thing you know you can spend you can spend two or three months putting together something and have a budget and and then and then send it to all the producers so yeah i mean i, I would prefer that system to be fair that that because that is at least people being creative and i'm delighted to see so many people are you know that's what's so great about this that a ge- you know a genuinely good idea that's just almost come from no you know has almost just appeared as if by magic um has then gone on to rightly be a successful thing. That yeah, I mean, I don't think you know. Maybe, well, maybe it, it would be hard to do a sitcom of it, wouldn't it? Because you'd sort of need Jurgen Klopp yeah, to be in it. You'd, yeah, like maybe, maybe when his football <laughs> manager career. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you, you on the last show you talked about how your husband didn't like you doing um, jokes about sex because you know he felt that was a private area. But this, the book is you know, is you imagining being married to someone else, which I know you you joke around about within the context of it, but is, is he, I mean, is he ha- he's happy because he's getting his mortgage paid? Yeah, his biggest <laughs> problem was that he's a Tottenham supporter and oh, is it? <laughs> now I'm like weirdly associated with Liverpool. He just, I think he finds it so stupid that I've become, because m- my, <laughs> my novel that's coming out this year is about netball and mm. he's just like, I just don't understand how you've become a sport writer. <laughs> like the clock book got nominated for like sport book of the year. Wow. And Tom was just sitting there like, <laughs> I just don't know what parallel universe I have fallen into that this has happened to you. Like this is insane. But isn't that what's great about it is because I'm not that interested. And I know a little bit about football, but I'm not that interested in any sport. But this, you know, you don't, it's a book that, it, if you're interested in sport, it doesn't matter. If you're not interested in yeah. sport, it doesn't matter. So it's it's kind of for everyone, and you yeah. can you know, it's it's and it's just really funny. It's just like funny, funny, funny. So it's 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 a very and I always prefer the audiobook, and I know you say in the audiobook you're a fan of audiobooks. So yeah. it's 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 always great when you get the the author. I think especially if the author is a comedian, because it would be it would be crazy to, for you to have got someone else to do. Yeah. This. But it's uh, but it's um it's it's just enjoyable. And it's and it, at two hours long. It's you know it's. It's, it's only almost like, like an super... extended podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, it's and it's it's because often I'm listening to audiobooks and I'm enjoying them, but I'm thinking, oh god, I've got like 25 <laughs> more dog walks to get halfway through this fucking. Thing. <laughs> you know, you want to move on to the next thing. So the one that you can actually listen to in a day, or is and I, I, I like those. I mean, I, my last book was. Um, or well, the one before last was the problem with men, which was just a, a twenty five thousand word book, which is probably about the same as this, isn't it? Um, yeah, and like uh, you know, it's 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 a it's a good for the modern world and for our lack of uh, con- being able to focus on things anymore, which I think is a real lockdown thing as well. You know, I think it's become so hard to focus 
that it's just lovely to have something so short. Hey, look, so let, let's talk about some stuff we didn't... We might talk about your other book as well later. We did talk about... We talked about netball in the last uh, half an hour. We, we covered a lot in the, like, that half an hour. In um, but you were you brought up in Taunton, which was very near. Yeah. I was brought up in... I don't think we talked about this. I was brought up in Cheddar. I grew up in Cheddar. I moved to Cheddar when I was eight. Ah. So you were, brought, you were Taunton born and raised. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And uh, do you feel, first of all, uh, Taunton is the county town of Somerset? Yes, it is. Uh, do you feel, I feel, if I was born in Taunton, I'd be annoyed that Somerset wasn't called Tauntonshire. Because oh. most, you know what I mean? It's like mostly, not in the southwest so much, but most of other places, other counties, it's like where I live in Hertfordshire, there's Hartford, you know, Yorkshire, mm. York. It's named after the main, shouldn't it be called Taunton, Tauntonshire? But That's Somerset is such a pretty word. It is. I always but... thought if I had a kid, I'd like to call them Somerset. <laughs> I just think it's a really lovely I mean... name. Yeah, there is there is Somerset Moor, isn't there? So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it it's been yeah. done before. I think yeah. Somerset's beautiful. It's Taunton. It's a bit Tauntonshire. Taunton. 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 I'm from Taunton-shire. Yeah. Taunton. Yeah, but I always liked. I re- I can't remember because the Tone is the river that goes through Taunton, and when right. I learned that it was called Taunton because it's a mash of Tone Town, town on the Tone, that's where Taunton okay. comes from. Taunton. And I okay. just remember thinking that's fun, but it's not okay. as nice a sound as Somerset. No, I guess Somerset. not. Somerset. It's so principled. Um. Do you know that, and I've learned this from a YouTube comment about one of your things, that your school in Taunton had an assembly about you? Are you aware of that? No. Oh, my well, God. They a... are thin on the ground for subject. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know it's what It's not happened. like they could read any excerpts of any of my work. <laughs> 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 There's a girl. There's, there's a reply to one of you. We just done. A, someone's just done an assembly about you in our school. So we're oh my god, you school. poor so bastards! I, I really I didn't go to a good school, and that is such a, <laughs> a, a damning indictment of my schooling. That there's, that there's never been an assembly about me at my school, so I'm very <laughs> jealous. I presume um, it was in a biology lesson, and they were sort of pointing out all the different <laughs> words you can use for vagina. <laughs> But that's it. You could become a successful comedian and an author, even though you've gone to our school. That's what they're saying. Who is your favourite uh, Taunton-based uh, celebrity apart from yourself? Do you oh know any? God, uh, are do there you know? Any? Did you ever? Did there are? I'll give you some. I'll give you my favourites. You've got it's it's a it's a good place to produce funny, well-rounded people oh, who are right. great. Jenny Agata was born in Taunton. Oh, and I, my and children. There was yeah. I used. I mean, I do still love her, but I used to. You know, I I, did, I wrote about regretting. She's about, I don't know how much old. She's a little bit older than me. She's like 15, 16 something years older than me or something like that. And so she was in Taunton at the same time as I was in Cheddar, but she was obviously way too old for me then. There was one time I walked past her. At, I, I walked past her in the BBC canteen when I was about 22 and she'd have been about 37 or 40 or something like that. And I went weak at the knee. I didn't did joke about it, but I actually went weak at the knees when I saw it. But looking back at that, I think that was the moment, wasn't it? That, was, that could have been, we could have had a little torrid affair, her kind of having a midlife crisis and me being, hey, look, that was, the, the, that was our moment. Start tweeting about it. There's a book. There's a book deal. It's too late now. Well, you know, <laughs> I still love her, but you know, I'm married now. And you know, it's not quite, it's, it's, we're both a bit too old now. But there was that moment. It's that it's finding that moment, but you know that's that's life, isn't it? It's just you've got to grasp your moment. Should have grasped my moment with Jenny Agatha. Deborah Meaden is from Taunton, who's oh. a previous guest on this, who I I love. Um, Gary Rhodes is from Taunton, who I'd forgotten. Oh yeah, had, had, I think I knew I'd, that. I'd, I'd forgotten he died, so I've just had a very upsetting. I saw like it, the twenty nineteen, you know, to twenty nineteen. What Gary Rhodes hasn't died? And then I looked up and remembered that Gary oh. Rhodes died in twenty nineteen, and I'd forgotten, and now I'm upset again. So thanks for that, Laura Lex. Sorry. It's your fault. Is there anything you can record? Did you, did you, when did you, did you stay in Taunton until you were 18 or did you? Yeah, you, lived yeah, there until so I was 18, still go back every year. What is, what, what's your big recommend for, for Taunton? What do you think people, why should people visit and what should they go to see? Oh, Taunton's just lovely and so is all the it's surrounding nice. area. Like, So I'm technically from a little village called Norton Fitzwarren, which is just outside Taunton. But the Quantock Hills, up um, Tur Hill, Cothelstone Hill, all that walking bit. And actually in Taunton, my favourite bit is where the cricket ground is and the brew house theatre. There's a little riverside shopping area down there and that used to have the most fantastic cook shop. I'm not entirely sure 
sure what's there now, but it's this really pretty little bit of independent shops and and bridal shops, and it's all cute and lovely. Mm, that is nice. I don't know Dawn that well, given that I grew There's up. There's not quite much near. there. I really. went to see I went to see the cricket there sometimes, and I've I've played there, but not for ages actually. I'd forgotten all about the. Uh, the theatre in Taunton. It's nice, isn't it? Yeah, it's, nice it's nice, the brew house, yeah. 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 And they're oh, always, every time I go, it's they're shutting it down and then the residents save it and then forget that they <laughs> saved it and stop visiting it and so it shuts down again. And you think, if you want it that much, just start buying tickets to stuff. It's not that difficult. And did you drink much Blackthorn cider as a as a youngster? Oh, yeah. Was, yeah. The Is Perkin that made in- Warbeck, that's the spoons that we used to go to all the time and it's got like a really long bar in it. And uh, oh, Western Cider, we used to buy our Christmas tree from um, Sheppy's Cider just up the road. Yeah. Perkin Warbeck's one of my favourite historical characters. I Just yeah. his name, just his name really. Cool. But it goes back to Richard III. We were already talking about your Richard III thing. And, and I yeah. actually went down a little rabbit hole after listening to your thing of looking up Richard III and the princes in the towers and uh, then Perkin War- Warbeck. Was was he pretending to be Richard? Yeah, from the he town? was somebody that they um yeah wanted to bring in as as he was a distant relative and yeah. he had a claim to the throne, but it got quite quickly squashed. Yeah, it wasn't. He wasn't really Perkin Warbeck and Lambert Simnel. Those were the two. Yeah. They're, they're two names I'll never forget from my uh, school time of history. But Perkin Warbeck's a good guy. Good uh, name too. Good. Perkin. That's very good. These um, my it children, is. Perkin and Somerset. Perkin and Somerset. That would be that would work well. Um. Before you became a comedian, you worked, according to Wikipedia, you worked as a search engine optimizer. Oh, I did, yeah. <laughs> what, what, what is that? Tell me more about that. <laughs> that was, um, uh, oh God, what was it? So I'd, uh, I, I basically was a sa- I was in sales, um, and I used to have to try and sell people video content for their websites where you'd make like a daily little video that um that had all the keywords in that you wanted your site to come up for um I knew nothing about it. I remember going to the interview. I'd, I'd graduated the year before. Then I'd gone out and done like a mini ski season thing. Then I came back to London and went, right, I need to get on with this comedy thing. I just need a job to pay enough for me to stay in London. And I went to this interview and he was like, you clearly know nothing about technology, but you are quite willing to walk into any room and talk to people. And I was like, yes, I am. So I got this job in sales for it, but I hated it. No. I hate. I did it for about two years, I think, and then I left. That's but, a long time for a job, though. Two years is still like you, oh you stuck it out God, for a long it time. It felt like my whole life was just in the toilet because <laughs> like, it was in Canary Wharf or South right. Quay, and like I, I'd lived in Somerset for eighteen years. Then I'd gone to Canterbury to uni and done drama, and then suddenly I really wanted to be a comedian, but I needed to work from like eight a.m. to six p.m. doing this like. Oh, you know the sort of job where everybody goes out on a Friday in their like fancy suits and just gets smashed and you're like, I don't want to do this, but I don't have any, like I needed enough money to stay living in London. Oh God, it was excruciating. And I'd be like (laughs) in the office from eight till six trying to chat to people about how to get onto the first page of the Google rankings and what was going on on this SEO forum and blah, blah, blah. And then I'd get in a car and go and do a mirth control gig in deepest, darkest middle of nowhere i was like surviving on about two or three hours sleep Ugh. oh well, i hated that period of my life <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah it is i sort of I, di- I didn't do many jobs in london i i, I sort of i was lucky because i did about six months of doing temp jobs where I, mo- I moved around quite quickly i didn't i didn't stick any of them out for very long um and then i got an advertising sales job which i got sacked from which meant i could go on the dole and then we could we could do the enterprise allowance so i had a year after after about six months i had a year where i was getting my rent paid and getting like 40 pounds a week and was able to live off that whilst i struggled to make some money from comedy which is a shame that that doesn't that that isn't available though there's so many people trying to do comedy now yeah it it would bankrupt (laughs) the government even more it's basically a furlough uh but uh yeah it's 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 sort of it is, you forget. I think people don't realise how how hard it is to, and increasingly hard to get through those first years oh when you're trying God, to do stand. Yeah. So what what kind of what sort of when was what year was that you were working? Was that, um, that would have been? What would that have been? Twenty twenty ten to twenty twelve. Right. Because I saw a bit a, less than that. I saw a clip of you doing spank 
in, I think, about 2012 or 2013. Yeah, well, I started doing comedy in 2009. Right. But I didn't, I couldn't afford to stop working until 2015. 2015 was right. when I did the SEO job for a bit, then I did temping for a bit, and then I moved down to Brighton and I had two jobs. I worked in a kitchen shop and I worked at the Brighton Dome, um, both on zero hours contracts, like so oh. I could shuffle them around comedy right. but then I never got that moment of like I'm quitting my job to be a comedian <laughs> because I just one day my boss phoned me at the kitchen shop and was like you haven't been on the road for a couple of months do you still need the job and I was like oh I guess I don't like I guess I've sort of edged into having enough comedy work so I never got that like I'm out of here and I'm never coming back oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, well yeah, it's you know, but it, I thought it was interesting. I watched you on I watched you on Spank in what early twenty tens, and then I watched your um, or I just watched your live at the Apollo. And one of the jokes is the is the same joke mm. about that you and it's kind of nice. That is that does that feel good to know that that joke you were doing in twenty twelve uh, went to you know you would how would you you see you know to to think that within like five or six years you'd be on live at the Apollo. That's, oh that must God, be pretty yeah. cool. And the, getting to that, do those jokes. Yeah, uh, just. I never thought I'd get something like Apollo. I just thought I was such an uncool circuit dweeb. And I was like, nah. But And then, yeah, to be able to do it and not worry about it, like knowing that by the time I did it, I was like, I've got three 20s that could all work really well as a, like, ch- choppy, like, pew, 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 pew. Um, and so you just, yeah, I've got no, I like, I know some people would be like, you're still doing a joke from eight years ago. But I'm like, yeah. <laughs> It works. No, no, I'm think, keeping it in. Like. I think that's, although there's an extra, there's <laughs> an extra, gold. <laughs> there's an extra bit on the uh, on the original one. There's an extra bit about. Uh, I don't want to do the joke. There's a bit. There's a bit. Uh, there's an extra punchline on the in the spank version that wasn't on the live at the Apollo version. Ah, uh, was it too filthy? It probably. I got think it cut was probably. From, I, I think probably it was did too it live, <laughs> and then it got cut because they edit out so much. Because I, I really garbaged my live at the Apollo because they said I was doing a whole bit about Debenhams, and they said you can't say Debenhams, you have to say department store, and this was my biggest worry for the whole thing. So I walked out and I got going and I was like, this is going all right. And then I went, Debenhams. Oh, fuck, I knew I was going to do that. <laughs> and the whole Apollo just sort of went bananas. So I had to sort of wander into the wings and be like, look, I can do this again. I'm really sorry. And so it was such a nice moment of them, like, seeing the curtain <laughs> behind the curtain and me being like, oh, piss. I will never be professional. <laughs> <laughs> People do love that. When we went to see Panto Land at the Palladium where I probably got COVID, the, uh, there's like so many bits in that show where they they pretend that something's gone wrong. I mean, it's allowed in Panto. Right? Yeah. But, but, they, but they play it really, they play it really straight as if they've got, you know, so everyone believes, especially my kids believed it, but I think everyone sort of believed it. And me and my wife going, well, that, no, that was clearly a tap. My mother's like, no, no, I think it really, there's a bit where there's, there's um, Paul Zerdin's uh, Ventriloquist dummy, he turns it on so it works uh, independently of him. And there's yeah. a bit where Don, and you know, they're like five, six weeks into the run now, there's a bit where Donnie hasn't, picks it up a bit badly and it goes up, it breaks down. And then they're, he's talking to him back saying, what, what's happening? You know, they're, and they're doing this thing and, and everyone thought that was real. And you go, there's no way. <laughs> there's no way that's, it might have happened once and they thought, let's keep it in. Yeah. But, but Donny Osmond, absolute professional, doing all that. Paul Zerdin hitting him with these zingers and he's going, oh, you know, as if it's the first time he's ever heard them. Uh, to, <laughs> so to the extent there was a 1% doubt in my mind. <laughs> Would you ever do Panto? Have you done Panto? I haven't. I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, it was sort of cool to go to see it at the Palladium. What I really loved about um, more than the show, which was fine, and Julian Clare was in it, and he's brilliant. But it wasn't really a panto because it was just, mm. it's just, it was more of a variety show. And I'm glad I took the kids to see a panto uh, before Christmas as well because it wasn't properly a panto. But it was, it was entertaining. There was lots of good stuff. Uh, but all around the proscenium arch, they had the they had the posters of you know all the pantos that have been in that place for 40 or 50 years like peter sellers was in one of them oh, and, wow. yeah you know, there's one there was one that was uh cannon and ball rod hull and emu this is all before your time really but uh marty where there was just every single person john inman was in it from my yeah. pizza and that was the one i really wanted to see just because everyone was like a bona fide Derek griffiths everyone was a bona fide star of their time but i bet yeah. it was a really fucking good pantomime yeah, I, I, I i don't I, yeah i'm I, they've you're all sort of aware as you're watching, especially when you're watching on the 6th of January or whatever, 
that it's a job that people are doing because they get paid a shitload of money for it. <laughs> and so they were very good. They were very professional and, and, and uh, you know, they did a good show. But you're also aware, Don, with Donny Osmond having to go through all of his hits and uh, go through the motions. And it, mainly people were there to see Donny Osmond. The, the audience were nearly all over 60, I would say. There was hardly any kids in the whole place. Right. So they were all there to see Donny Osmond. And Donny Osmond just really going over his old hits and then slightly taking the piss, but slightly doing it seriously and doing a very sincere song about how clowns are amazing. Um, did, he do, feel- um, did he do any Mulan ones? Uh, no, oh. I don't think. Well, I don't. Well, I don't know what that. I don't think so. But I don't know. Um, uh, but there's a sort of sadness to it. Julian Clare is lucky because his whole persona is, you know, I'm, I'm too, I'm too good to be doing yeah. anything. <laughs> so it really works for him. But I think I might find it just a bit too much of a ball ache. But, no. <laughs> but the the uh, there was a part of me thought, oh, we wouldn't it be great to be on this stage, do a panto if all those big stars have done it? And I think you would have fun, mm. but. Um, I've always got so, so you know it just it's a lot of time. Yeah. But I, but I think they you know the big stars are earning just enough money to. And what else you are you know, doing I, in January? Well, it's true. I could be doing. I could be doing December and January, but it's a, it's over Christmas, isn't it? Yeah, I'd but it, w- it only just starts before Christmas, doesn't it? Panto traditionally is like end of December into January, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think I'm um, the kind. You know, Al Murray's done them, and I think mm. he's enjoyed them. But I don't think I'm the kind of person that Panto's been falling over the side of the game. get to do all of his cock? Oh, yeah, maybe not. Um, so I don't, I don't really know what I would be. I mean, I suppose I could be Baron Hard up or I, no, being a pantomime dame would be quite interesting. Mm-hmm. But you, you know, in be this, the front end of a horse. I could be the, for the back end of a horse. In this day and age, though, in that it, it hasn't affected anything. But I wonder, there's the sort of political correct nature of pantos having to exist in the modern world while still having quite old world world values so a man dressed as a woman for comedic effect is sort of the kind of thing that i think in 10 or 15 years people might be going oh can we still do i think i hope we still can because it's it's a different tradition than Mm. um you know than than something unpleasant but gary gary wilmot was the pantomime dame and he was he was he was pretty good um he's very good actually but the, we we saw one in Well and Garden City, which was professional actors, but no big names, and it was it was better. Yeah, that's think, so fun. Than, than, yeah, my granny used to take us every year because I've got like a billion cousins. I think there's something like twenty four of us, and she'd always said like, "There's you get enough stuff for Christmas, so I'm going to take you to a thing." So we'd always go to a panto in the week between Christmas and New Year in sort of Sherborne or somewhere like that. It was great. Yeah, it's nice. It's a lovely thing doing that. And it's, you know, when you've got young kids, my son is it's so hard to get him to concentrate and sit down. So if he sits down and properly watches something, it's good. But Panto Landy was bored by in the second half. Right. Understandably, he was not that interested. Yeah, <laughs> big growing up. There was an old couple behind with a had a walking stick with lights on it that lit up and he was more interested in that. <laughs> so, yeah, that's how you get my son. But my daughter, my daughter pretty much enjoyed it. But they've been to see a few things. We're going to see. We're going to go and see Frozen, the musical, in the Ooh. next month. Which uh, it might be all right. Might mm. be okay. We'll see. We'll see. Let me ask you some emergency questions before I ask you what's going on in your future and about your new book. I'll go back to this one. I don't. Well, I've asked you a few, but uh, I will in the last time. But I'll try not to double up. Um, uh, now this is an interesting. I don't think I've ever asked anyone this question. This is question six one one in the orange uh, book. Uh, the second orange book. Uh, would you rather be able to channel the spirits of dead celebrities or never have to replace the light bulb in your bathroom? Bathroom light bulb, please. Yeah, okay. I know that's very boring, <laughs> but I just, I've just i met lots of live celebrities and I barely wanted to hear what they had to say. Okay, so, fair enough. I'm not sure I want the dead ones interrupting me. I think if it goes, because in my bathroom, we've got kind of quite a few of those little lights that I don't yeah, even know. I don't yeah. even know how to change them. That's they haven't what we've gone... got to. Yeah. So I, I think I might agree with you. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I won't ask you that. Uh, I'll get into some rude ones. You were, you were very funny with the rude ones, even though you said you wouldn't do rude rude stuff. But you, you found a way to do rude sex stuff <laughs> with, without upsetting your husband, which is very, <laughs> very impressive. Um <laughs> Okay, look, this is this has come up. Uh, this is I've never asked anyone this one either, Laura. No, you'll see why when it comes out. It's terrible. If you could only ban one of the two, would you ban badger baiting or masturbating? I mean, it's you know, it's not a question, is it? Are you aware of what badger baiting is? No. 
Badger baiting is, I'm not quite sure. I think it's basically making badgers fight each other or certainly shooting oh, yeah, badgers I'm very cruel. Ban, ban that. Badgers yeah. Are, yeah, badgers are hench. I mean, we shouldn't mess would, with badgers. Who would ban masturbating? I mean, some people would ban masturbating, but, you know, I wouldn't have them on my podcast. No. All right, masturbating we'll good... is just one of the best things in the world. It's free. It's yeah. it doesn't hurt anybody and it's there's no calories and it doesn't affect climate change. <laughs> if true. anything, we should be doing more of it because if we were all more distracted doing that, we'd stop doing all the other terrible things we're doing. Well, make the most of it while you can is what I would say. People like a lot of people tweet me saying, Oh, you can spend all week in bed masturbating because I'm I have to self isolate. I can only really do one or two a day maximum now. So, now that is a tragedy. Yeah. That that's, is a tragedy. When I think back <laughs> Even ten or fifteen years, I would look at that and go, "Ah." Oh. So I've got to save. I've got to save it up. I can't. I've said this before, but I can't afford to waste one now. So if I've got anything, if I've got any chance of the real thing coming up, I have to plan right. very carefully. Yeah, because I can't. In the old days, you could just waste the first one, and the second one would be ready to go. Not now. now not now. It's not time management. <laughs> might get might get two in in a day if you're lucky. But. <laughs> I've only got one ball as well. I don't know if that's massively affected. Mm. You know, I didn't do, I didn't, I didn't do like a dipstick thing before. No, I should have, I should have done a before and after just to see just whether it was a bit and the, then a puff of air. Yeah, whether the new guy, the old guy, the one that's left, might double his efforts. I step up. It's his time to shine. Yeah, well, it is, but I, I, you know, I don't think he. But it's hard to tell. It's so, so many things go wrong, Laura, as you get older. This, you know. So what I'm saying to the youngsters out there, masturbate as much as you can. I'm not sure if it's this. I don't Into think it's the cup, same for women. And then do a little sharpie just to <laughs> yeah, measure. Just do that. Just, and then pop that on your windowsill. And I'd also say to my young fans, don't badger bait. It's, it's no. not good. We're not, we're, that's you don't not, want to upset badgers. They're big and there's a lot of them. There are. Yeah. they get. I see a lot of dead ones. I saw there was a dead badger. When I first moved to this house, there was a dead badger <laughs> on the roadside. In my bed. <laughs> On the roadside, but it's far enough out of the village that no one was going to do anything about it, just on the roadside. And I watched, as I drive past once or twice a week, I would just watch this badger gradually <laughs> decompose. Oh, welcome to the that's neighbourhood. What, that's what the countryside's like. Eventually it just disappeared. But I'm, yeah. I'm tempted to go back and see if there's a badger skull there or anything. Um, I'll ask you, let's do, let's let's try and find a good, let's try and find, I'll go to earlier in the book when I was trying hard. You know, I, if you're saying, can you know, you're worried about stretching Klopp actually out into a book. <laughs> I've done four books of these. I've done four fucking books of just questions. Um, <laughs> I'm not asking that. Um, what is the most disgusting thing you've ever had in your mouth, Laura Lex? Kimchi and dolce latte. Okay. It was disgusting. And I have a very um, active gag reflex. Okay. We were in a Michelin starred restaurant and I put it in to try it and it tasted so revolting that I hocked it back up into my hand and then didn't have a napkin. So I had to walk through the restaurant carrying a handful of kimchi and dolce latte to go and put it in the toilet. Wow. I don't know what it is. What is what is Kimchi is fermented cabbage oh. and dolce latte is like a soft cheese, like a oh, really yeah, okay. strong cheese and it was together and it was like you know when you put something in your body just goes this is wrong get it out <laughs> it's going to kill you um and so I had to get it out before I was poisoned it was so disgusting good I knew we'd get some I knew one of them would pay off and that was a very interesting so it says a lot about you I don't know <laughs> you go around eating whatever that is kimchi and dolce latte. look at you who do you think you are I'm very fancy well you I think it's very more, fancy. Tom really liked it he was like just try it and I don't like being the sort of person that doesn't like things so I was like well yeah. I'll try it and then um yeah just sicked it back into my hand yeah I would I'll try and eat most things I think that I've got a few things that I think from like I don't really like um creme you know the text something that's got that texture of texture of creme caramel that kind mm -hmm. of those kind of things make me feel sick. Yeah. And gazpacho, but gazpacho soup I had when I was young, and then I was sick after it. <laughs> my uh, my friend's girlfriend, who was also, had had made this cold soup, and I, and I felt, and I think I was actually physically sick afterwards. So there's a few things that make me feel yeah. like just the um, thought of it. Yeah. yeah. 
mackerel because I was sick after I ate mackerel. Now I can't oh, really yeah, eat mackerel. Not, oh, I love mackerel, but yeah, that is a nasty thing I, to stick I up. Might, I might be able to go back to it. I don't know. Right, so you've got a second book, and we talked about netball because I'd, I'd written netball in my book last time you were on, and mm. you were saying how netball was... Uh, you know, not your favourite sport, but you've written a you've written a, a novel about netball. So tell me, is is that yeah. coming out this year? Yes, yeah. It's ca- yeah. Um, is it, it ready to go? It is. I've I'm just going through the copy editor's notes at the Fantastic. moment and having that. Did you have this with yours? Where like the copy editor obviously knows how to write properly, and so <laughs> she keeps adjusting my sentences. And I know she's right, but my brain's going no, fuck off. <laughs> I wrote it the way I wanted it fuck off so I have to do this read through so many times because the first read through is just me reading all of the notes and going no no <laughs> no and then I read it again and go yeah okay all right you're probably and then I read it again and go yeah that is easier to read actually well done you're very smart and good it um, is annoying I think again as a stand-up it's very hard to start you you're so you I know you have been directed in your Edinburgh shows but it's it's very hard to even take an opinion from someone else because you, you've worked out what you're doing. Yeah, and I think, like, with stand-up, you have a bit of an idea and you half-write it and then you go and try it out and you see if it's got legs. Yeah. And you slowly piece something together by doing that, whereas with a book, you just sit on your own and write the whole thing and then by the time you find out if any of the public like it or not, it's too late. It's published. That's so <laughs> stupid. Like, stand-up is so much better in terms of developing a product you know is going to work and you're not worried about it. Um, but, yeah, the new book is probably the material I would have been doing when we chatted in 2019. That was about netball and how I yeah. just felt like netball is this joke played on women. Um, and so I... I the, the book that I'm writing, well, I've just finished writing, it's actually based on a TV idea I had where I wanted a vehicle to get a load of women together in a TV show of all different ages and backgrounds and stuff. And I thought, how do you do that without them being mums or working in the same place? Yeah. Um, as I can't have children. So I just, and I'm so tired of watching stuff about mums and, and I just didn't want to do workplace has been done. So I thought, so, so sport, that, happens all the time but it's mainly usually men's sport um so I thought like oh a a netball team like that that could be interesting and then I thought well who the hell plays netball I'm not going to write a book about like professional netballers I don't know anything about it so sort of developed this character in my head who you know she's late 50s and her husband just walks out on her one day and she sort of realizes she doesn't have a job anymore because she's retired the kids have grown up her husband's gone and she's just a bit like I don't know what I do I don't know what my life is anymore like I feel like I've done the main bit and now I was just gonna potter along quite happily and then he sort of blows that apart and she just doesn't know what to do so she and her friends start a netball team and it just sort of great opens her world back up to meeting different people and sort of trying to work out how to have a life again after what she thought would be a life has gone. Um, but I thought like netball, I think is such a like little niche world of memories of being at school and just learning this ludicrous game. And then I think like 95% of women stop playing it at 16 when you leave school and just never really think about it again but I learned from doing it as stand-up that when you bring it up in a room you just get these (laughs) shrieks of going like oh god and everybody remembers what role they played like what position they were (laughs) and you start going like do you remember chest pass and shoulder pass and bounce pass and the three second and pivoting on one foot and it just brings back this amazing feeling of everybody going Oh, netball. <laughs> so I sort of wanted to make it into something. Great. So when's that out? June. Fantastic. Which feels a lot closer this side of Christmas. <laughs> and are you doing the audio book again? I hope you, so. I haven't been yeah. told if there's going to be one, but I hope so. Yeah. Oh, I'd there, like will, to. there will there will, will be one. I the thing I think that they should change in publishing is you should do the audio book before you do the final draft of the book, right? <laughs> because then so every time I do an audio, I go, oh, what? and like the fact with the problem with men, I managed to get a few things changed in time, yeah. it was just in time to go back and just change it before it got printed up. Because they do it fast now, they do print it up pretty fast, and so they can do it a bit close to the time. But in the old days, if you spotted an error, you just had to wait for if there was ever a second edition yeah. or a reprint of it. And it's so frustrating to go, why did I? Because it's there's so within a proper book as well, within like a novel 
you've you know you've what have you done eighty thousand words or a hundred thousand yeah, words or something like that. that. You know, there's it's so difficult to be on top of absolutely everything, uh, which is why editors are, are very important. Um, but that's the uh, thing because they've slightly fucked it with me because now they're going like you have to have this edit in eight months before the publication deadline, whereas I'm right. like, no, I don't because with Klopp, actually, I wrote the whole thing in seven <laughs> weeks and it was released within six weeks of me finishing the edit so I know how fast you can turn this round so if I want another two weeks I'll take another two weeks so yeah. they've just slightly made me into a garbage author now <laughs> but they I think they also factor that in my I've got I'm writing a book about my uh, experience last year and I've got I'm, I'm, I'm you know I'm about two thousand three thousand words in at the moment and uh, it's meant to be ready by the end of the month. But my editors already said, oh, you know, we'll give you more time. Yeah. <laughs> so I think they, because they know I did the other one so fast that they kind of kind of go, oh, it'll be all right. And it, mine luckily, came, I think once you've done a few, it gets yeah. a lot easier to, they sort of trust me really to, to get on with it. And on my last one, they basically had nothing to say about <laughs> changing anything. Um, they basically said, yes, that's fine. Put it out. Not quite, but almost. But uh, they should have spotted a few of the mistakes that I then later spotted. <laughs> I saw some advice on Twitter where if you're looking for like typo errors and stuff like that, change the font and suddenly you see things differently. Right. Like you'll pick up on spelling mistakes and stuff that you can't see when it's all still been in the font that you've written it in. That's interesting mm. because every single time I've ever written a book or even a program or anything, the minute I pick it up and turn it to the first page I turn to, I'll see a mistake yeah. straight away, <laughs> which maybe that's why because it's in a different <laughs> Maybe it's just littered with mistakes. Uh, and uh, well, are you, are you still? Have you have you been doing stand up? Is, is stand up? It's been yeah. going this year, and it's hopefully going to carry on going. Yeah, but, uh, I'm back to stand up now. I d- I did my tour through the lockdown. I did it all online rather than waiting right. and constantly reshuffling. So I'm back to circuit now, which is just Great. lovely. Yeah, it's so nice. <laughs> and are people are people coming out? And is it yeah. is it via? It's working. It's viable. I think it's been like a real mix of either it gets cancelled or it's sold out, and there's a waiting list of 200 people waiting to go. Like it's right. so up and down. But yeah. most of the stuff I've done. It's just been great. People are really ready to get out and get on with it. And it's that nice thing of going, the people that are a bit nervous aren't here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's fine. Like they're at home and I've, I'm still doing some Zoom gigs. I did, on New Year's Eve, did a Zoom gig for people at home. I'm hoping that those just stay forever because for people that can't get out or just like want to see something but don't want to do a babysitter and tickets and taxis, you know, yeah. sit at home and watch it. it, it they're really great. Terrific. And do you think you'll be doing? Are you going to be doing Edinburgh this year, or is no. it just the book? No. no, no. We are adopting, uh, oh. and so everything of my year post the book coming out is a little bit of a massive question mark because I don't yeah. really, I know where we are in the process with it, but there's it's just such a question mark on timings for the whole thing. So sure. I don't know. Everything past June is a bit of a, but I don't think I'll ever do Edinburgh again. Really. I'll never do a whole month up there again. It, okay. There's no point. I I don't. It doesn't do anything. So no. I I don't like. I would go up for maybe a week, ten days, and warm up a show ready to tour it. But yeah. the days of me getting a show ready and then showing it off like Edinburgh is a plinth to show it off on. What's the point? I've done several five star shows up there, and it doesn't. What's like? I don't know what I'd be looking to get out of it anymore. Sure. It certainly isn't money. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're going to have a family as well, it does yeah. it does completely change. Uh, we to, I'm still trying. I'm still working out whether I think we're going to. I think Katie's who says hello by the way from Drunk Women Solving Crime uh, is uh, going to go up and do ten days. So I, I might I'll, go, I'll probably go up and do at least the podcast, but um, for yeah. ten days. But but that's it's quite a good place to do to do the, the podcast. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but stupidly expensive. And we still I, I paid the rent for 2020 and have only had half of it back. So you know we're all it's. If you can do it and lose money without even going, that's yeah. quite impressive. Um, but, oh, well, good. Well, good luck with uh, – that's very exciting about yeah. – uh, uh, it's nice to be able to – could you get – how much choice do you get when you're adopting a child? Do you have, like, a <laughs> row of kids? Because yeah. I I, I'd have, I wouldn't have chosen my, my son. <laughs> you wouldn't have got yours. If he, if he, if he, if he <laughs> I'd have chosen my daughter, but my son, I'd have gone, now. Nah, to chuck him back in. We'll have another go. <laughs> So it's quite, is it, is it like they all come out and you go, we'll take that one? It's, or, there's actually, there's a, it, it's a bit like uh, online dating. There's a whole okay. brochure and, and you know, you're in a brochure and they're in a brochure and various social workers play matchmaker and go, yeah. hey, this is.
this kid's got no attention span neither is Laura so let's see if they can make each other laugh for a bit um oh, you can be as prescriptive as you like but it obviously if you walk in and go hello this is a list of attributes I need my child to have they'll probably look at you and go are you the best parent <laughs> <laughs> so you sort of have to I... go in pretending you're going to be good at everything and yeah, what I like about being a parent and, and what I like about the madness of it all is just the random. I mean, there's a, I suppose there's a genetic connection that they might end up being like you, but they don't necessarily. No. And I think it's just that that random nature of not knowing what you're going to get at all is is kind of exhilarating and weird and fun. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that, oh, what, a, what, a, what a wonderful thing. That's, that's going to be I'm uh, excited terrific. about it. Yeah. I think I'm kind of... Now that I've done my grieving on not having biological children and I've got my and I've gone through the stage of thinking, well, I'll adopt and then after a year of settling in, it will be the same as biological children. I'm actually like I'm weirdly excited to have a kid that's not biologically like me because I hope then I won't expect them to be like me in a way. Yes. Yeah. In some ways, I like who I am. In some ways, I'm like, oh, thank <laughs> God, I'm not passing any of this nightmare on. <laughs> like, it dies here, and you'll come with your own stuff, but <laughs> yeah. I'll see you as your own person because you're not an extension of me. You are a person that turned up in my life, and hopefully it will make it, you know, I'll really respect that you are your own individual rather than I ha- I think I would have a tendency to be like, well, I don't like that. So why do you like that? Whereas <laughs> well, that's very healthy. seeing it's, you. It's very healthy. I think a lot of parents don't realise that. And it's a very difficult thing to, you know, to not see that connection. You know, I see a lot of myself in my, in my son as much as I take the piss out of him. <laughs> it's only because he's, he's, he misbehaves in exactly the same way as I, I yeah. used to. But, um, but yeah, it is, it's so important to not let i mean even just in parenting though it doesn't the way you were brought up not not to allow that to necessarily cloud because mm. i think the inclination is anything that was good you try and foist on them for you and anything that was bad for you you try to direct them away from yeah <laughs> and it's you might you've got to let them you've got to let them come to you and and direct themselves really and it's it's hard it's hard but it's uh you're gonna have a great time it's, i hope it's, so uh, very excited extreme. oh well i'm really pleased about that laura that's that's a lovely piece of news and well done on giving up edinburgh uh, <laughs> <laughs> i'm two years clean <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was that's we, we, were, we were forced to go cold turkey uh by some circumstances and now we don't have to go back but, but i think i will be back uh, i'm i'm so i sort of want i, I haven't done a stand-up show since uh uh since 28 17 18 and i'm kind of keen to go back and do some new stand up mm. but uh, i don't think i'll do it in edinburgh this year i don't think there's it's just finding the time you know it's finding that time to invest the amount of time you need to invest in creating a new yeah. show it's just uh so insane even when you've got an idea but uh i've you know i've milked my balls as <laughs> first only once ball. a day though yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> for as much as I can. I don't know if there's a stand-up show in it as well, but we will see. Anyway, enough about me. This isn't about, well, it is, it's mainly about me, this show, but it's also about you. Uh, that, do go and buy Clop Actually. I'd recommend the audio book, but the book is also fantastic and uh, very, very, very funny. Well done, Laura. I'm so pleased that, that, about everything that's happening. you well deserved. And thank you for doing the podcast. Thanks for we'll having me. You. That's my pleasure. See you soon. Bye. Bye. How'd you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>